There's a tradition in Washington that when you want to think about CBO, you usually invite all the living CBO directors to sit on a panel and discuss, uh, to reminisce and tell war stories. Um, Bill Hoagland did one of these at the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, on the anniversary of the Budget Act, and CBO itself is doing one tomorrow. And uh, I'm enough of a budget nerd to say that I actually really enjoy those sessions. Um, but I thought it would be useful to do something different and to think about people who are consumers of CBO information. And so we've assembled a panel here of people who have very different perspectives. Uh, and let me introduce them briefly, and then we'll, uh, we'll turn to the conversation. And I want to invite you to join us. We have Alice Rivlin, Bob Reischauer, Doug Elmendorf, Bill Hoagland, people who have been around even longer than the CBO, uh, who, who, who may be able to contribute to this conversation. Uh, at, the, at the far end there is Bill Gratison. Bill Gratison was in Congress for 18 years, from 1975 to 1993 and served as a Republican ranking member of the House Budget Committee and was also on the Committee of Ways and Means. Um, he actually can tell us what life was like in Washington before CBO, right, Bill? Since he started at the Treasury in uh, 1953, even after he left Congress, he continued a distinguished career in public service at the Health Insurance Association of America, at Patton Boggs, and at the uh, Public Co Company Accounting Oversight Board, which was created by Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, next to him is Susan Tanaka. Susan is now the Vice President of Research at the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, which is an organization that worries a lot about the long-term debt and deficits, is very much a consumer of CBO information. But uh, among the many things that Susan has done in the past is work both at OMB and at CBO. Uh, then we have Alec Phillips, who is, uh, had never worked at CBO, but he did once work for the Senate Finance Committee. And uh, for the last 15 years or so, he's been at Goldman Sachs, where he keeps track of what's going on on fiscal policy for their clients. And I read his emails assiduously. He understands a lot more about what's going on on Capitol Hill than most of the people at Goldman Sachs. And that's because he's, <laughs> he's one of the few people at Goldman Sachs who actually lives in Washington. Um, and, and finally, last but not least, Bruce Morrison. Bruce was a congressman from my hometown, New Haven, Connecticut, from 1983 to 1991. He later was the uh, chairman of the Federal, Home Loan, uh, Federal Housing Finance Board, which oversees the Federal Home Loan Banks, and is now uh, has his own firm, Morrison Public Affairs Group. Um, so, uh, and the only reason I'm not sitting with them is that we can't fit five chairs on this stage, so uh, <laughs> it's not any kind of dominance thing going on here. <laughs> And unlike the Oscars, I'm not coming out in my underwear and I'm not going to sing. Um, <laughs> um, so I wonder if I could ask each of you, Bill, maybe I can start with you. Um, so you're, if, as a consumer of CBO information, both as a member and after you left Congress, what, what was it that what you found useful about it? What was, or was it useful at all? Well, there's no question it was not only uh, useful, but it was essential uh, for one thing, since it was the official score uh, wherever I was working, but we pretty much figured those were the numbers that we had to take into account. W whether we thought they were right or wrong, they were the numbers that would be the basis for uh, scoring purposes. Uh, beyond that, they help in the development of policy. Uh, I have done these various things since leaving the Congress that you mentioned. Currently, I'm uh, serving on the uh, Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. I've been there for four years, and we're using CBO numbers all the time. Uh, because as we consider alternatives to the current uh, re reimbursement uh, uh, pro process updates, if you will, uh, in the various silos that make up Medicare, we know those are the numbers. If we have suggest something that may increase costs, so we want to try to be constructive in suggesting ways to pay for uh, our, uh, our proposals. And do you find CBO ever frustrating? No, I really don't. Uh, but I, I think the. Are you still I, a Republican? But I, but I think. That, <laughs> but I, I think the best way to explain this is that uh, I, I came into the House in 1975, just as this, 40 years ago, uh, 40 years ago last month, and the budget process was just uh, underway. Uh, Republicans were to say at a low ebb is an understatement. There we there were a hundred approximately a hundred less. Republicans in the House than there are today, just to attach a number to the dramatic change. And 
I, I did sense a, a lot of lack of enthusiasm about the Budget Act, um, mainly from the appropriators, who I think are probably still not very keen on it, which is understandable, because I was on Ways and Means, and when the budget required some action uh, in terms of deficit reduction, call it spending or revenue increases, we had a choice between cutting program, program spending, let's say in Medicare, which we often did, or in uh, increasing revenues, but the, but the Appropriations Committee had, had no such option. In any event, uh, I was uh, there for a while before I uh, spent 10 years, I was gonna say served 10 years on the Budget Committee, which is a little like saying serve time, but that's another <laughs> matter of words, <laughs> servitude. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do playing with words. Uh, in fact, I jotted down four of them, which I think are kind of fun. Um, things that we certainly didn't have at that time. Reconciliation, which sort of, I think, means people of different views coming together to make a decision. <laughs> sequester, one of the meanings of a sequester is for the government to insist that money be set aside until a resolution of a legal dispute. A directed scoring, that's a nice hammer type approach to the issue. And then deeming resolutions, which is how you pretend you've done something that you haven't done. <laughs> but, uh, but what happened, what really happened was is that uh, Republicans you know, were being pretty much out of the process, which is understandable since the budget committees, like the rules committee in the House, are, are leadership committees. That's just how it is. And uh, there was an incident. I wish I could tell you which, what the specifics are. Many of you may remember. I do not. But where the, where the CBO... Uh, made some pronouncement that sent Speaker Wright right up the wall. He was absolutely fur publicly furious about it. About that time, I was just coming on the Budget Committee, Del Lada of Ohio was ranking, and I remember a private conversation with Del. He said, hey, you know, Bill, maybe this place is on the level. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that over time, we need more and more people on both sides of the aisle to see that their party is not being singled out by things that they don't like. Bruce, uh, in your time on the Democratic side of the Hill, did, did you ever find uh, CBO frustrating? Or did you, were you, are you one of the people who thinks that basically everything they do is wonderful? Well, uh, be, being in the Congress is frustrating. <laughs> um, but it was somewhat less frustrating when I was there than it is now because at least there was, um, there was conversation across the aisle and some sense that uh, solving a problem was more important than winning the next election. Um, so I, I think CBO was, first of all, I came in in 83 and it was already part of the furniture in a way that it hadn't been before. Um, I have a science background um, in addition to my legal background and and that's some, that made me um, like the idea of analysis and, and information. Um, not all my colleagues had as high a, um, um, enthusiasm for it. Um, I, I was elected with a group of Democrats that were different. Uh, we were elected in 1982. This was in reaction to the Reagan budget. Uh, there were 26 seats, changed hands and there were 57 new Democrats that year. Um, and we came in worrying about fiscal balance and deficits because the, you know, the Reagan deficits were a real thing and the Reagan decisions to um, cut taxes uh, without a corresponding cut in the expenditures was, was real political as well as I think substantive information to, to debate. And um, I remember telling Tip O'Neill when I was brand new and wet behind the ears that deficits mattered, and he wondered whether I was a Democrat. Um, two years later, in 1984, I was in a meeting where he said deficits are the, the issue, so you know, everything changes. Uh, I, I think that, that in that era, um, it, it isn't that anybody thought CBO was you know, perfect, but it was a tool and people had a lot of debates about the budget, and there was a lot of budget activity during the 1980s, and it didn't all come out right necessarily, but there was a seriousness to it, the freezes and all of that. I was a participant in lots of floor resolutions on freezing spending. So I think that was an environment in which CBO was respected. And I worry about an environment in which somebody wants it to 
be on their side because but, that's that's but, really the danger. But so we've come from a period of time when Bill Gratison came to Congress where there were Republicans were a distinct minority to a period of time where the uh, they have taken over the, the House and uh, both in the New Gingrich era and in the John Boehner era. Yet my perception is that compared to a lot of other things in Washington, CBO has managed to avoid being uh, too caught up in that partisan thing, that there always seem to be people of both parties defending it. And I'm curious why you think that is. Well, first of all, do you agree with my hypothesis? And secondly, if so, why? What has kept CBO from becoming a ping pong ball in the partisan? Well, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't speak too quickly, I guess is what I would say. I think there's a real danger. I mean, dynamic scoring is more about tax taxes than it is about, about spending. But it's all about whether you can impose a kind of one-sided economic model on something that's supposed to try to be a consensus tool. And, and so I think there's danger. And I think everything has that danger in what, the way we're running public policy in Washington right now. Uh, I mean, I think everything, including you know, think tanks, have that problem of being perceived as you know, peddling one side's uh, point of view rather than peddling information that people can debate. Um, so I think there's danger. I think it has, I think there's been, I think CBO has been run in a very, in a very professional manner by very skilled people who have tried very hard to cleave to, a, to a, an image of their own work that has objectivity at the core. I mean, objectivity is hard to achieve, but I think, I think that that has gone on. But the longer that the town operates in a way that, that sort of has, is so, in which the partisan divide is so much, you know, there's just two ways of looking at the world, and the world is all one way or all the other way. And that's the way I perceive the way we talk these days. Um, all institutions are at risk, and I think CBO is at risk, too. All right. I think Phil... Joyce makes a good point in his paper, with which I'm sure you would agree, that one of the reasons that CBO has maintained its integrity is that the budget committees have seen it in their interest, and, rel and successive budget committee chairmen of both parties have prevented it from becoming a thing. Susan, so you sit at, at Peterson, and, and like all of us who study fiscal policy, you're, you look at the numbers coming in from CBO. How do you evaluate what they do well and what they don't do so well? Well, as an organization whose entire mission is devoted to long-term fiscal policy, we're very dependent on CBO. We, we have to, we turn to CBO for, for our numbers and for our analysis, and I, and, and I think that we're generally pleased that happens that CBO tends to agree with us in terms of the dangers of long-term uh, fiscal gaps, so that, that helps. But I also think that um, CBO has done several things well. One, as Phil said, they're authorita authoritative. So CBO has managed to build up credibility, um, and it has now become the place where, because it doesn't have a partisan dog in the fight in terms of specific policies, it's, it, it's hard to dismiss when CBO says something. Um, it's not generally taken as a wacky sideshow. So when CBO comes out with an estimate, a number, a report, it's hard to dismiss it as wacky. From our, from our point of view at the foundation where we're um, focused on fiscal policies, that's really important. Secondly- Can I just interrupt it? So more so than OMB, and if so, why? More so than OMB, and having spent a good number at OMB, OMB has a mission. OMB is an advocate for the president's budget. And one of my former political bosses said, OMB examiners would kill for the president, any president. You know, <laughs> there is no question that part of OMB's, OMB's job is to advocate for the president's policies, whoever that president happens to be. CBO does, has an entirely different role, which is to be a neutral party, neutral analyst of, of very difficult questions. How does policy affect the budget and the economy? Hard to say. But they are not swayed by being an advocate for one party or another. So I think that's the primary difference between OMB and CBO. So they've established that authoritative, neutral credibility. Um, they, they also, I think, um, have over the years developed the vernacular, the budget vernacular. So they've they've set the terms of the debate. They have common. They have words when they issue a report. We know what they mean. 
everybody may, may disagree, people may disagree with what CBO's findings are, but nobody's questioning what the words mean. So they set, serve as a very valuable reference port for, point for the debate. So we're all talking about apples and apples instead of pineapples and grapes. And I think that's really important. That's, that's very helpful to the debate. So people can then focus more on the policy differences rather than uh, what, what is this animal? Is it a cow or a pig? Um, finally, I think that CBO improves the quality of the debate. That when we were at OMB, we always knew that our budget estimates were going to go over to CBO, and CBO was going to scrub them. And as a result, that made us be more rigorous in our analysis and more careful in our assumptions. So because CBO was there, they served as a very valuable, um, they, they kept us from being sloppy. You can't be sloppy around CBO. Now some would argue that CBO has taken up too much of a role in that way. They, they've become the opiner of what's good and bad policy. But I don't think that's what they're trying to do. I think what they're trying to do is define um, what's a reasonable estimate, how a defensible estimate, and then people can differ over the policies. People will disagree about whether or not they've made the right assumptions. But I think everybody knows that at least it's been through a good quality scrub, and that, that in itself is very important. Alec, um, I think most people in Washington don't ever think of Wall Street uh, depending on CBO for anything. So could you talk a little bit about how you use CBO and how you think uh, Wall Street in general looks at the numbers that are coming out of CBO? Sure. So um, we probably use CBO's numbers in two main ways and, and maybe one difference is we're you know less focused while we care about the long-term budget outlook that's not our primary focus our primary focus is more for instance on figuring out what quarterly issuance patterns are going to be for treasuries uh, figuring out what the year-on-year -year change in the deficit is going to be uh, both again for issuance purposes as well as for that matter for uh, figuring out what the fiscal impulse is going to be on growth and, and that sort of thing um, and I mean, I would echo, you know, generally what's been said about the uh, not just the neutrality, but sort of the definitive nature of of CBO's estimates in terms of their authoritativeness. Um, you know, the, the in some ways the frustration at this point is we, in theory, do our own budget deficit forecast, but there's almost little reason to do it now because CBO ends up getting it right and we end up getting it wrong, and then we have to kind of mark to CBO's forecast again and. Um, now, occasionally, you know, they'll have one thing that may be a gray area. What's, you know, good about CBO is they'll acknowledge that it's a gray area. So, for instance, you know, will corporate uh, tax receipts rebound in a given year? You know, maybe we have a slightly different view. Sometimes that view works out to be right. Often it works out to be wrong. Um, but, you know, so those sorts of things are the things that we look at. Um, I would say that in general, um, what you could probably see is that on the street, uh, people have tended to do, you know, maybe a little bit less of their own fiscal analysis at this point and are relying more and more on CBO simply because there's not, I mean, as somebody said to me at one point, there's no reason really to do it yourself anymore. Um, and so, and I think that's a Plus good sign. Plus it's free. It, it's free. Um, you know, they've got, uh, they've got, what, a couple hundred people uh, working at it, and that's a lot more than, say, the five uh, people on our economics team. Um, and so there's, so there's not really a, a good reason to go out on a limb and try to do it yourself. Um, now, that can be dangerous sometimes because if everybody has an accepted point of view, you still want to sort of cross-check that point of view. But it's now more a question of you know, where could CBO possibly be wrong rather than actually trying to come up with all of the answers on our own. So now we're at this point where the Republican leadership is contemplating who to pick to replace Doug Elmendorf, whose term is up. How important is that to, to Wall Street, the credibility of that person? Uh, I think it is important. Um, I think what's mainly important is that um, the person is going to take a uh, fairly objective point of view and ultimately get to a point where the answer that they're producing is the right answer. And so to sort of, you know, I, I don't have a particular view on sort of the dynamic scoring question, which is more of a joint tax question anyway. Um, but in general, I'd say the most important thing is that um, the next person is seen as, you know, number one, objective, first and foremost. And then number two, has the expertise to actually guide, you know, what is obviously an agency with a lot of expertise. Uh, 
uh, to get to the actual right objective answers. And you know, in many cases, there are objective answers, at least in terms of you know, what is issuance going to be over the next year, what is the deficit going to be over the next year. Bill Gratison, one of the things that one hears most often from critics of CBO when it comes to health care goes something like this. As Phil Joyce mentioned, uh, budget offices in general require a certain amount of proof evidence before they're willing to say that something saves money. And that's for good reason, he suggested, because uh, most of everybody else wants to uh, exaggerate how much something saves or minimize the cost and pretend there's a free lunch. But um, when you look at the American healthcare system and we try and figure out what might we do to change it in order to have better quality with slower rising costs, we're going to have to experiment with some things that may that we don't know work. And uh, the, the argument is sometimes made that CBO has created really bad incentives for good policy because they will only score things that definitely save money and that prevents us from trying things that could really, uh, though we don't know for sure, pay off in the future. Do you, do you share any of that concern or not? I've tried to understand a, a lot of parts of government in my work over the years, and I've never run into anything as complex as healthcare because there's so many interconnections uh, that what you do in one area may have, uh, which you mentioned, which was mentioned earlier, people get better care, live longer, it costs more. <laughs> that seems to come as a surprise to a lot of people who say if you improve the quality of healthcare, you're going to lower costs. Well, maybe you will for a few years, but what about when they're 95 or 100 years old, you know? Um, so I think that, to me, the, there is an assumption based upon the experience of some parts of our healthcare system that improved quality and lower cost go hand in hand. I do not doubt that that already happens in some instances and can be demonstrated. I am not about to accept, though, that that, as a general proposition, can be applied to the entire uh, health care system for a whole lot of reasons, because uh, there may be special circumstances that might prove that possible in some instances and not others. A better answer to your question is that the Affordable Care Act uh, provided a very substantial amount of money, which is now being used uh, for a number of experiments. Right. And we'll see how they work out. Uh, the initial uh, r results with regard to accountable care organizations uh, is, is, is certainly not a huge uh, success. I'm not saying they may not work out in time. I'm not saying some of them, some of the pioneers aren't doing OK. Uh, but uh, the, the experience, as I read it so far, is that it may be very difficult within the framework of a basically fee-for-service system, which is what the accountable care organizations are built upon, uh, to really uh, achieve the results which it seeks uh, to achieve. People are attributed to these organizations who can seek care outside of them, which makes it a little hard to control costs or have a real um, uh, ongoing review of the entire health care So you're basically situation. suggesting that CBO's skepticism about the promises that some people make about health reform is justified. I'm only saying it, it's going to take time to, uh, to, uh, to find out. With regard right. to the ACOs, the great pressure is to give them longer. Right. But that begs a more difficult question. Are these folks that are participating, and I know there are exceptions, but are many of the organizations that are new to this kind of thing right. capable of taking risk, of understanding risk, of, of budgeting for risk? Right. Well, I, we have colleagues here at Brookings who are trying to answer that question. I, I think the answer is, so far, maybe. Mm. Um, but, yeah. Bruce, I think another way to look at this is, and, and Phil Joyce referred to this, sometimes the problem seems to be not with CBO's answer, but that Congress lets that dictate its policy. Do you think that we've become too driven by the score, the CBO score, and that that's stopped us from doing things that might be in the public interest? Yeah, let me take a step back from that a minute. Uh, I mean, a lot of these, what, what might be called criticisms of the limitations of, of a CBO score, are the limitations of a CBO score. Um, people would like to solve more problems, but CBO has a hard enough job already in terms of just cost assessment. And it seems to me that um, 
that looking to it to, to, to make it easier to make hard decisions um, rather than give inputs to hard decisions is, is, a, is where the mistake is. So I would agree with your, your, basic, your, your base, basic premise there that in, at the end of the day, Congress is, doesn't have to be slavishly tied to, well, it costs this, so we can't, I mean, it's more about how we've apparently lost the ability to say, you know, if you're going to fight a war, it costs money, you have to raise taxes to pay for it. God forbid that anybody should do that. Um, there was a time that that was sort of an obvious answer. It's no longer an answer. So uh, many of these things are, are political problems that no objective enterprise is going to solve. Um, I also think that there's, a, there's an interesting thing about the politics that I found when I was in office, and I was trying to argue about um, the president's budget and deficits. And I couldn't get the media to cover that issue using CBO numbers as anything objective. Uh, the media wants there to be a debate, a horse race, whatever. They want the, the, um, the politician on one side to say the deficit and all of these, you know, this is the fiscal picture, and the other side to say, no, 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 it's not because of ABC. And nobody wants to actually report something as an objective fact, and people are welcome to have their solution to that objective fact. I don't know that that's CBO's problem, but I do think it's the media's problem uh, that there's very, there, there is very little energy for reporting facts um, and, and a lot of energy for, for reporting debate. So, um, you know, that's another problem CBO can't, can't solve, but it is a problem with running a you know, a democracy that addresses its problems. As a recovering journalist, I measure events by how long into the event is it before someone says the Ashes problem the is the press. And I just <laughs> want to establish that in this event, Congress got blamed first, <laughs> uh, uh, which as it should be. But Susan, I think that one, one way, I mean, if, if CB, so when we think about the financial crisis, one of the, and we think about all the people to blame, one of the, the we, we often blame the credit rating agencies and the accountants and the, quote, risk management committees of these banks that seem to be more about risk and less about management. Um, and so we say that one of the reasons things went so badly was the, the guardians, the, the gatekeepers, the people who are supposed to hold authorities accountable let us down. So uh, is it possible to say that we should judge CBO not only by the quality of its information, but by how effective it is, is help is at forcing members of Congress to uh, n not uh, forcing members of Congress to accept the laws of arithmetic. So, is there things that CBO could do differently that you think would lead to better fiscal policy, or do you think they've at the the, the frontier of what they can do? Well, I think that in terms of long-term fiscal sustainability, there is something more that they could do. And it's always been frustrating to me that we have a 10-year baseline that comes out in the winter, spring, and then a long-term outlook that comes out sometime in the summer, which disconnects the short-term from the long-term. And I think it would be really useful, and this is more important now that we're, um, the youngest baby boomers are 51, and they're soon gonna be 55, and when they get to 55, we all know they're gonna probably be exempt from any further entitlement cuts. Um, that we, we are up against that big demographic shift. So the long term is now very much short term. So I think that one thing CB, CBO could do in terms of the long term problem is connect those two time periods because the short term, 10 years, looks relatively benign now. But we know that we still have a long term problem with deficits and debt. Um, so that's one thing I think CBO could do. I think. I don't have any problem with CBO being more conservative in terms of its, its estimates. And if there is bias, I would hope that they would be more biased towards more information and being more conservative in there and what they think legislation will do or not do. Because after all, again, as Phil said, their job is to figure out what the impact of these policies will be on the budget. And while it may be that overall health care costs go down or um, things are better out there in the private sector, we know what's going to happen on the budget, and it's CBO's job to sort of to account for those policies on the budget because it's different. Policies that are funded on the budget come from taxes or future taxes. 
And that's what CBO is accountable for. They cannot go out and control, account for what happens in the private sector. So I think that I would hope that they would be more um, But that might lead us to do things that are very nice for some budget accounting spreadsheet, but not good for the country. That can't be the right. No, that's not. And I think I do think in things like healthcare, where we know that it's the balloon you push in one place, it pops out somewhere else. That in some place, like in something like healthcare, it's important for CBO to provide as much information as it can about what the impact will be on the on the private economy. Same thing with pensions and these these big issues where we really know that there's a really close linkage between what the public sector does and what the private sector does. We should not allow the policymakers to think they're getting away with something free, but we also should account for what they're, what they're doing in ways that are visible to everyone else and that have people understand that that's not all there is. But after all, close to 50% of the population is going to be covered by federal programs in some way or another within a few years. So it's really important to understand how much is on the federal budget and also to understand what that's doing to the private sector. Alec? So I have, a, I guess, a slightly different view on the long-term versus short-term question, which probably also just reflects sort of my uh, focus, which is if I were to choose um, sort of how CBO publishes their updates over the course of the year and what they focus on, I would almost think of even the 10-year outlook as a long-term, very uncertain outlook and really just, I mean, for my purposes, think about the next one, two, three years as what you have kind of a firm grasp on. And, you know, 10 years is a long way away. I mean, if you look at the revisions to, just as an example, because it's in my head, the healthcare projections that we've seen over the last several years uh, from CBO, um, somebody can correct me, but I think the dollar amount has changed by over a trillion dollars in terms of the budgetary effects of reduced health inflation or health cost growth assumptions. And so, you know, to me, it almost would make more sense to push some of that, maybe in budgetary terms, medium term analysis out into the long term, and maybe even do more frequent updates of what I think of as the near term, which is something, you know, where we can on a monthly basis look at the monthly treasury statement or even the daily statements, and CBO publishes a monthly update and sort of say, okay, well, it looks like it's leaning a little bit more this way than this way. I'd rather actually get that sort of thing more frequently and think about the medium and long term, you know, maybe in a more in-depth way, but even maybe less frequently. Hmm. Hmm. Do you think you know enough about the black box, about how they come up with their numbers, or do you, or not? Are they transparent enough? Um, so I feel from my own position, because we try to do something similar and we do just a very simplistic, naive version of what they do, that I can sort of imagine the process that they go through. But in terms of actually understanding it and knowing it, no, I don't know. I don't know how they do it. I mean, I can imagine how one would have to do it, but I certainly couldn't prove it. Um, before I turn to the audience, is there anything, what, what construct, if, if uh, while we were talking here, the, the, the leadership of Congress anointed someone to be the next director of CBO, what would you tell him or her ought to be at the top of the list of things to do? No? I think I'll pick up on the last point. I, I think transparency is extremely important. I think that it's important to make your assumptions as clear as possible. I think we should recognize that one of the biggest changes over the last 40 years has been the focus by organizations like Peterson, like Goldman Sachs, like people in uh, a academia, not just hired guns that are working for some industry, but people who are really concerned about these issues. Uh, and they should be able to understand how these numbers were arrived at and therefore able in a discussion to agree or disagree with some of the uh, fundamental assumptions. I think that's uh, in terms of the inside part one point I would think is very important. Another one is to encourage staff uh, to feel free to come up with analyses which would be made public, somewhat like CRSs are made public, even if they don't necessarily represent the views of the overall organization. I know that's a big ask, but I think over time it could help to build credibility. And a final point, and, and I'm going to ask you to bear with me just for about a minute because this I did write down, I would like to see a plaque on the wall uh, at uh, CBO and 
and its critics, which would go something which recognizes that we are just emerging from a very sharp extended economic downturn. And unless I miss something, and the plaque would indicate, it was not anticipated by the Fed, the White House, the Treasury, the Council of Economic Advisors, the Congress, the Joint Economic Committee, the Banking Committee of the Senate, the Financial Services Committee of the House, either Budget Committee or by CBO. I mean, there's got to somehow or other be an acceptance of that uh, it's future is kind of hard to predict. Yeah. And that we've seen a major, major gap, which is a whole lot more important than whether they are off even, even $200 billion in a 10-year projection for Part D of Medicare. And, uh, and so there's, um, I've often thought as a former member of Congress that there was, and this is speaking of myself, not just others, there's plenty of room for humility because we had a lot to be humble about. It doesn't seem to be the slogan of the House at the moment. Uh, Bruce, what would you tell the next director of CBS? I, I, I think the focus is on, on uh, maintaining, the you know, maintaining the credibility of the institution. Um, and I think Bill is, is, has identified a number of the aspects of that, but you can't, you, you can't be too aware of how easy it is to destroy something that's taken a long time to build. And um, uh, that, so I think that a very high degree of respect for that, um, that task, and I think that means very much today cutting against the grain of, of partisanship, meaning that y you, you have to, you know, you're not going to serve as effectively as they might like the people who are going to select you. Hmm. Um, and you're going to be encouraging the other side of the aisle to, to trust you, and that means to talk to you. And to have a, a relationship that's that's not going to be as easy. I mean, it's never been easy, but it's probably harder now than it's that it's been before. So that's that's where I'd put. Susan, the is there anything you want to add to what you said already about? Similar thing. I, I guess what I would say is trust the staff and do no harm to the staff because it's a very highly qualified, very dedicated staff. And if it could, that's that's how I would say a director would matter. If a director came in and it destroyed the staff and destroyed the organization, then we would have a lot to lose. That's easier advice than Bruce's, which says that the first thing you ought to do is piss off the people who appointed you, just to establish your credibility. Alec, is there anything you want to add about what you think the new director should know? No, I mean, I, I think it, you know, you asked before about sort of the transparency question, and then there's also this question of neutrality, and it seems to me that that's kind of the key tension to balance, because the more transparent some of the assumptions, for instance, get, the more then people can pick those things apart. You have to have some transparency, but you also you know, don't necessarily want to litigate every single little thing. So I think it's just working on that balance. OK, I, I, someone has a mic, right? Ah, Brendan has a mic. Uh, there's a gentleman here in the front. And why don't you tell us who you are? And if you okay. want to direct your question to anybody in particular, yeah. please well, do so. Uh, for the panel, uh, starting on the left. You are? Uh, Bob Weaver, Kelly and Weaver, it's a law firm that represents local governments on environmental infrastructure. And the question is, should CBO report on revenue options for the budget, including use of dedicated revenue for infrastructure and national park investments? So Run this by me again. Should they report? Yeah, should CBO report on revenue options? I mean like charging user fees and, and uh, public-private partnerships, that kind of thing? Well, not P3s. That's, that's not revenue. Uh, user fees are, national user fees shared with the states is definitely revenue, including use of dedicated revenue for infrastructure uh, national and national park investments. Okay, so let me, let me, I think I see where he's coming from. So I think the one way, another way to reframe that is, so we have this sense in Washington that somehow we're not spending enough on public infrastructure and that the, if we, but it's hard to raise taxes, so we have to find some other way to say we're financing infrastructure. Is there some role that CBO has to play here that they haven't played to date? Does any of you think? I don't really know. I mean, I, I would say I'm aware already of, you mentioned reporting on options or, or that sort of thing. I mean, as far as I know, in their uh, budget and revenue options 
book, I think they actually have a gas tax increase already in there. Um, so, you know, they have to some extent, I think, already reported on that. Um, beyond that, I mean, I guess, you know, there probably is a role in terms of additional analysis of the benefit of, let's say, a user fee uh, and the distributional consequences there versus, let's say, a uh, corporate tax change, which has been obviously discussed as one right. way to finance infrastructure in the near term. I mean, I think there's certainly a role to play there, but my impression is that to some extent they are actually kind of playing that role. Well, user fees exist for highways, tra uh, airports, uh, and um, uh, and other kinds of infrastructure, parks, national parks, land and water conservation fund. Right. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in the back there. Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Crisitello, CBO, class of 1990. <laughs> I have a specific question appreciating CBO's statutory charter. Might there be a larger role for CBO in working to enhance public understanding of fiscal issues facing Americans? Phil, if you want to join in here. Uh, well, I mean, as you know, as I said earlier, I think actually C CBO is playing a greater role in that respect than was ever anticipated. Um, and the question is whether, you know, you would want to amend the law in order to say it's CBO's job to inform the country, not just the Congress. I think it sort of does that anyway. I think if you made it more explicit, it could it be as likely to be dangerous as not. And plus the fact that um, I'm not sure beyond just making public <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> the studies and the reports that CBO does, uh, if doing that kind of thing might detract from what its sort of main role is. So I mean I I don't know that I would go any further than what's already happened. And and to be honest, you know CBO directors, uh, ex CBO directors, uh, some of whom are in this room, have tried in a sense to do that, but do it through the media. Uh, you know, which is to say we want journalists to understand, people who report on the budget to understand what is behind our numbers and what it is that we do so they are reporting accurately to the public. I don't know how much I would go beyond that. I think that CBO has come a long way in terms of making its material more, its information more accessible to the public. If you go back and look at the very first economic and budget outlook, Compare it to today, you'll see that there's been quite an evolution in, in terms of accessibility for the public. But as, as an organization that spends its time trying to educate the public, I think that um, CBO's better strength lies in doing the analysis and doing clear, doing clear projections and estimates. There are many, many organizations in this town and around the country who will take that information and put it out in the public space. We like to think that we do a good job, but I think you have a richer debate if you have um, perspectives coming from the right, center, and left than you would if you tried to set CBO, CBO up as writing the textbook on fiscal issues. Yeah, I think I, I want to tackle something you said that CBO in my time in Washington has come a long way. With the internet makes it easier. There's many, many more graphics. And I, the way I always thought of it was that the challenge of CBO was to explain this stuff to the average member of Congress. And given the average members of Congress understanding of these issues, they are probably aiming just about the right place for the American public. Uh, Phil Wallach, you had a question. Hi, Phil Wallach of Brookings. Um, I was wondering if you could, somebody could talk a little bit about how PAYGO affects CBO um, and how many of these criticisms about the narrow or limited um, perspective of CBO is actually related to sort of the, the, the limitations of the pay-go way of thinking uh, where we precisely line up pay-fors and cost estimates and maybe have a harder time thinking about probabilistic big picture uh, savings. All right, just to define the term, so you mean that if a member of Congress has to find a way to pay for a program that he or she is proposing, then that puts pressure on CBO to kind of find, help them find something that equals that, as opposed to saying, uh, let's do something that makes sense. Is that kind of the gist? Yeah, I mean, it relates to the discussion of, of healthcare that was happening as well. If you're 
thinking not just about um, a, a single a single line item cost in the budget, but the bigger picture social costs of something. Yeah, I can't answer that directly, but <laughs> regularly I'd have groups come in from my district to uh, ask my support for some. I mean, I mean it sincerely. Very good cause research into juvenile diabetes or whatever. And uh, I'd make a point every time, <laughs> surprised I ever got reelected, I'd make a point every time and say, how would you pay for that? More often than not, the response was, that's your job, Congressman. <laughs> so I, 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 I think that uh, trying to line those things up has its uh, difficulties. That's why we generally call it a general fund. As a matter of, of public finance theory in general, uh, there are a lot of limitations with if you have to line up uh, a specific source of revenue for each major type of expenditures. We're accustomed to it in some areas, or we used to be at least, with regard to highway finance. Um, in some states, for example, uh, the uh, actual funding available for education might be related to a you know, particular, particular fund. Maybe the lottery winnings go, among other things, for that purpose. But I think wisely at the federal level, we've not thought about um, isolating those, tying those things together in that way. And I think that's one of the purposes of the budget process, where you try to lay it all out and you can draw your own conclusions about how much revenue is needed, how much expenditures are, are, are needed from a total, rather than just looking at the slices. Chris? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think your point is a good one. I think PAYGO, I mean, PAYGO is the is the culmination of sort of the failure of the budget process um, as a writ large um, and the inability to, to, uh, to be governed uh, by an overall number and to have the debate within that number. And so PAYGO becomes uh, a, you know, a, a mechanistic tool to, um, to enforce discipline, which people have a hard time accepting in a broader way. Um, I, I mean, a lot of people very close to the process don't really understand PAYGO uh, because they believe that the revenue is, or the source of funds is dedicated in some way. Like, you know, Fannie and Freddie got a 10 basis point, 10 year um, increase in, their, in their, their guarantee fees in order to pay for a very short term um, uh, payroll tax holiday, um, that all happened. It has nothing to do with anything that happens after that. That's just a point. It's not only a point in time estimate, it's a point in time event. And it's all in the baseline. And tomorrow, you know, you can do whatever you want with those. You may have to find revenue to balance off or cuts to balance off so, so a change. But it's, it's a very unrealistic. I mean, it's unrealistic in a way that CBOs projections and estimates are not unrealistic. It's, it's, a, it's a mechanism to get something done and to say that you didn't disturb, you didn't increase the deficit. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a very holistic approach to the problem. Susan, you look like you're dying over there. Yeah, I, yeah let's just be clear that CBO did not invent PAYGO. Oh, so absolutely. So, uh, so CBO is, has well, Congress invented PAYGO. Right. CBO has <laughs> instructions from Congress that it must follow when it's, when it's putting things on or off the, the PAYGO scorecard. And so it's not CBO who created this. All right, but I think what Phil was saying is, is, is this one of the unfortunate side <laughs> effects of, of PAYGO is that everything is weighed like, as Bruce said, like we need an A and we need a, a minus A and rather than what's good policy. No, I think it's more an unfortunate consequence of what Phil called the free lunch. Right. That um, policymakers would like to do things but not have to account, account, for, them, not account for them on the budget. The gentleman right here, and then Stuart. Thank Butler. you. Uh, my name is Peter Gluck, and, I, and I'd like to ask uh, how people on the panel think the current political environment is going to impact the selection of a next director of CBO. And the context of my question is simply this. The effect of this incredibility of CEO has been, in large part, the result of the impeccable credentials and the nonpartisan management of the agency notwithstanding the personal views of its directors. Previously, even the current director was appointed before our political environment became so strident and dysfunctional. What's going to happen now? Want to take that one, Doug? 
Does I, anybody want to? Oh, Phil? Yeah, thank you. Well, I, well, I just wanted to say I, uh, I, was, um, I was around in 1994 when uh, the Republicans took over the Congress, and there were a lot of statements that were made to the effect that we need to clean the place out, CBO, and replace the staff with right-thinking Americans. And, uh, and that did not happen. And so I am, I'm not going to be real worried about it until there's a reason to be worried, because I think that uh, the capacity of an individual director to completely politicize the organization without just having a whole bunch of people leave en masse is not as great as one might think. And even in the past, when there have been concerns about this, the Congress has always behaved, I think, quite responsibly. That doesn't mean it's inevitable that they always will. Uh, but the point that I made in the paper and the point that I made earlier when I was speaking is that I would hope that the Congress would recognize that it is in their interest to have a strong, credible CBO. If I were the budget committee chairs, I would say a weak CBO, one that loses its credibility, is not in my interest, and it's also not in the interest of the Congress, uh, when it inevitably will end up in conflict with the president, some president, some day, over policy, and the Congress wants to have its views taken into account. So uh, I guess my answer would be it's important, but I wouldn't, th I wouldn't view it as inevitable that it will happen until the point at which uh, you know, it, it does happen, which I'm not convinced it will. Stuart Butler. Thank you, uh, Stuart Butler, Brookings. Um, Phil Joyce, at the end of his remarks, made two suggestions or two recommendations. One was that CBO should do a better job in indicating the uncertainty about its projections. And then in return, that Congress should take that into account and essentially see CBO as an input into making decisions rather than the sort of the crucial arbiter uh, of what happens. Uh, I wonder, first of all, whether the panel agrees with that. And then secondly, uh, if, they, if they do, what would be the best way to put those recommendations into practice through some kind of um, instructions from, from the Congress, some rule informally, what would actually make this happen? Anybody want to try that one? I'm not sure I can add a whole lot. I think that the uh, use of ranges, I happen to like the idea of the use of ranges as a means of, of expressing in numerically the uncertainty. Um, this may be a terrible analogy, but it's the one that comes to my mind, weather forecasts. You can check the weather forecast out to 10 days, and it'll give you some very specific uh, and anticipations with regard to temperatures and with regard to precipitation, um, zone by zone all over the United States. They'll also have a percentage of probability. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't think that's a conceptually uh, a bad idea. I also think that the uh, discussion, some of which I think was planned to be part of this, uh, the afternoon session originally for last Tuesday, of going back over some of the changes and the reasons for the changes in the scoring um, uh, for Part D, would, as an example, is, is very healthy. I think it's good to get out there and say we tried our best and this is what we came up with. But here's why. Here were the changes. We didn't anticipate the generics would replace brand drugs so quickly, uh, right. you know, high-priced drugs so quickly, things like that. Just, just to clarify, so what Bill's referring to in terms of this event is the original concept was in the afternoon to have a, 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 a closed door invitation only, but we would eventually publish something, discussion of how CBO handles two controversial matters of scoring, one on health and one on federal credit programs. We intend to do that, just the logistics made it hard to do it today. Um, I thought about a joke on weather forecasting to, at the beginning, which I controlled myself, but now you open the doorbell. So uh, I'm told reliably that CBO says that spring will come this year, eventually. Um, does anybody else want to weigh in on the uncertainty thing? So one, oh, well, well, I was just going to say something quickly, which is I feel like actually they talk a lot about uncertainty. I mean, if you look at the various fan charts that you see in publications, you read uh, 
couple of reports that they put out periodically, one on, I think, revenue forecast errors and one on overall forecast errors or something like that. I feel like actually there are a lot of caveats in there. I think the question is, do people pay attention to them? And ultimately, that's more instructions for Congress rather than instructions for CBO. I think that I would feel more, I, I think, Stuart, what I would say is that the problem isn't that CBO isn't clear about the uncertainty. It's that, um, it's that the Congress will take action, either on the revenue side or on the benefit side, that's hard to undo if it turns out that whatever information they have about the cost or the savings of a policy is wrong. So that means that you then either have to beef up the enforcement side of the budget to make so that you can ratchet back tax cuts or spending increases or provide some kind of speed bump further along if it turns out that the estimates are really off. In the case of Medicare Part D, it turned out to be a beneficial error. There was two, they, they were overly conservative. They, they es the CBO estimated the, m the benefit would cost too much money. And so that's a good, that's a good kind of problem to have that a, the benefit cost is less than you thought it was going to be. The, what I think that um, I worry about more is that it's going to be the other way. And it, it will end up, the policy will end up contributing to um, deficits in a, in a negative way. And then how do you ratchet back the benefits once they've been given? How do you ratchet back a tax cut once it's been given? So if you could beef up the enforcement side, then I think you could allow more of the sort of uncertainty into the debate. You mean if you tell Congress too much, they might do something you don't like? That's basically your argument, yes. right? All right. So, but I'm going to no, go no, back. No, no, no. If you're oh, if you're if you're too open about how uncertain you are, they might not. They might do something. They'll take. They'll naturally right. take the but least I think that's, costly. That's where it gets very tricky. So when we had the event a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago on uncertainty. Um, uh, Robert showed from the Office of Budget Responsibility of the UK showed how they do this. And what they do is when they make an estimate, they have a kind of grid and they say, so we're not really confident about this one because there's lousy data or because this is an experiment and there's really not a lot of evidence to know how this works or this depends on things that are very hard to predict. And so they, they did, it was very qualitative. It seems to me putting probabilities on stuff gets a little tricky because um, you, know, you could be accused of making up the numbers and that could actually be true. But I think some people felt that if you go too far in that direction, and you were sort of alluding to this, Susan, that CBO is going beyond analysis to basically saying, look, here's our estimate, but this is so wacky, you guys shouldn't do that. And you're crossing a line from analysis to recommendations which is a line that Alice drew right in the very beginning, that CBO was not going to tell them what they should do. So is no, I think that when the evidence isn't there, and I'd ask the CBO directors to, to weigh in, if there's not enough evidence to, to support an, an estimate, then there's going to be no estimate. So whatever. So the answer is zero. If you don't know anything, the answer is zero. You no, know, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but like on the preventive health debate several years ago, there was a question as to what the scorable savings were. And the answer was, well, we're not quite sure. There probably are some savings, but we just don't know what they are. So maybe not having an answer isn't necessarily equal to zero. You want to weigh in on this? Louise. <laughs> no, I know Doug doesn't. <laughs> I'm looking at Doug. So no, I don't actually know exactly what CBO does in that case when you don't have an estimate, when you don't have any, much data. And so you can say, we think it'll be something small, but we don't really know. And that, one of the questions we wanted to ask at, in the afternoon, which I, I'll let Doug answer, which is, you know, sometimes your best guess isn't zero because you use intuition, you use economics, you use, you know, common sense, but you don't have a study to say, we've tried it, it's been done, and so I can actually have confidence in my number. And I don't know sort of then how they treat that. So we'll let him ask. So, so in general, uh, we try and... Uh, very hard to produce an estimate. If there is a bill that is moving in the Congress, then uh, if there's any way for us to get a sense about the rough magnitude, we will put it down as an estimate. And the number of times when we will actually say we have no idea is very, very rare. And we, th I think that's on purpose. We think it is useful for us to give the members of Congress a sense of whether something is big or small. And if we have or in what positive or negative in its budgetary impact. And if we have enough information to do that, then I think it's right for us to do that. 
so I, I was, as you know, I was part of this, this event uh, about uncertainty in December, and I thought the example that Robert showed had about how the OBR talks about uncertainty was quite intriguing. Um, it is, uh, but I think it would take us a good deal of effort to, to always attach that sort of judgment to the estimates. And there's a regular trade-off that we face between doing new estimates of new proposals and elaborating on the estimates we've already made. And that elaboration sometimes can take the form of expressing uncertainty. And we've made a lot of effort in the last several years to show uh, the uncertainty, to quantify the uncertainty in the long-term budget outlook, in some of these forecast accuracy pieces, in a lot number of macroeconomic analyses. So we believe strongly in that, but there is a trade-off between, between doing that sort of analysis uh, to give confidence a region around a point estimate or to be more transparent about how we came to an estimate versus moving on to the next uh, assignment. And I think ultimately it is up to the members of Congress to decide how they want us to use our time. But in general, we find I think the people who are in the majorities um, are trying to, who are trying to move legislation want us to get on to the next estimate. And the people who, are, uh, who have less control over the process what, would like us to spend more time explaining how we got to the estimates that we, that we got to. And this, you can see why that arises. But I think that's the fundamental trade-off for some of these things. We, we would like to be able to explain more about how we came to certain numbers. And we'd like to spend the time quantifying uncertainty. But those, those things take time. Right. Alice, do you want to have a last word here about either this issue or how CBO turned out differently or similar to what you expected 40 years ago today? Oh, heavens. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Warren, I didn't prepare. This just occurred to me. So, I, I actually wanted to ask Alec Phillips a question. Oh, good. Uh, which is how he perceives the uncertainty faced by decision makers at Goldman Sachs, uh, how does that compare to, to the Congress? I mean, after all, your colleagues at Goldman Sachs are making huge decisions uh, based in, in the face of very great uncertainty. Uh, and uh, what do you tell them uh, about uh, uh, the uncertainty? Uh, is there inside a major financial uh, operation uh, a way of treating the uncertainty which would be useful to the Congress? Um, I think there are a lot of differences. <laughs> I mean, thinking of two, you've got hedging, uh, and you've also got the government's ability to run large budget deficits. Um, so I think, you know, in the end, I mean, I, I think the purpose for Congress when thinking about, let's say, economic uncertainty is much more about how to respond to that, not so much about minimizing losses or anything like that, though maybe there's a piece of that, but more about thinking about the effects um, that go well beyond the government's balance sheet. Now, you could say for a financial institution, there might be aspects where they also want to think about beyond their balance sheet. But obviously, it's going to be much more about just securing their balance sheet and, and, and minimizing any disruptions in the event of, let's say, a severe recession or something like that. So I think in many ways, there are a lot of uh, big disruptions, excuse me, big differences. One thing that did occur to me earlier, though, in the discussion of uncertainty is we haven't really talked about the fact that when you're doing 10-year projections, you know, you're going to have probably pretty major business cycle fluctuations throughout that. And how do you, I mean, thinking about the uncertainty of a given cost estimate for a given program or, or, or whatever, to me, that's actually less of a concern than people looking at 10-year budget projections thinking that you're going to get uh, the budget balance back to two point something percent of GDP and not recognizing the fact that there's probably a reasonable chance of a recession during that 10 year period. CBO, for instance, accounts for that, I believe, by plugging in a very small persistent output gap of half a percentage point, which in any given year is probably going to be wrong, but on average might be closer to right. Um, you know, I think most people in the private sector wouldn't really do it the same way. They would think more about contingency planning and so on. Um, but so I think that's probably the biggest piece of uncertainty that policymakers need to think about is, okay, it all looks fine right now, 
But in year five, what if you plug in a $1.3 trillion deficit instead of a $600 billion deficit? Now, how do we think about it? Um, so. Uh, there's a gentleman in the back, and, and then uh, Tracy Gordon. <clears throat> Mark Warshawski. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, motivated by a statement that Phil Joyce made that uh, the CBO gets things wrong, um, and he sort of, his approach to that was, of course it gets things wrong, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, um, or it's sort of to be expected. But I think um, some people think that it's a little different, it's a, it's a, it goes in a different direction, that they get things wrong, in other words, and that they should have known better right off the bat. It was, it was wrong because there was a sort of shoddy analysis or incorrect assumption or uh, missing information, which they should have had. Um, and you know, we can all, I think, come up with examples. I have a, a couple that I've discovered over, over the years. And really then the question is, if that's a possibility, and really it's sort of aimed to improve the agency you know, in terms of how it does its work, how could we do that? In other words, how can we identify those and learn from those mistakes, and we'll call them mistakes, um, to improve the process? The other thing is they should have more staff. I, I think that one, one of the biggest changes, in, uh, it was mentioned earlier in these 40 years, there's so many outside organizations very competently reviewing these things. Uh, so the, my answer is that you know, if after, if within let's say a, six months or a year after a budget comes out, serious people taking a look at it and say, you're you know, really screwed up this particular part of an estimate, that's worth conversation, conversation worth having. To come back a years later and claim there was some kind of bias uh, totally after the fact, um, I think just is, isn't um, fair game. On the other hand, we're talking about human nature. Uh, if there's a close pitch uh, on the outside corner, if it's my team, um, I hope it's uh, not called as a strike, that it's called as a ball. Uh, I, my favorite cartoon, which I think is relevant, and that's why I'm going to mention this and then I'll stop, shows a priest at a crowded baseball game in New York on his feet, shouting at the umpire, fist in the air, and saying, thou hast eyes, but seest not. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the point. If, if, if something is said, and you immediately can, or not immediately, but within a reasonable period of time, can point out an error, that's a conversation worth, worth having. I think if it's done way after the fact, I think that's just not fair. Well, but I would say that, uh, Mark, that that's kind of one of the things we're thinking about here, is that some outside group that doesn't have a dog in the fight should be able to look and see if not, if, are there things that they systematically miss? I mean, people are always going to miss things, and I think that's what Phil was saying. The numbers are wrong because they're estimates and projections, and life turns out differently than we anticipate. Um, uh, but, but the question is, is, really, are there things that you can identify that they should have seen, and that's a game we play with the Fed, and there's no reason we shouldn't play it with the CBO, but I think the bigger question is, and Phil dealt with this, are they systematically doing something? And, and Susan kind of made a case a little bit that, yes, they should systematically add on the, err on the side of being conservative, and some people think that's um, an unstated bias that should be, should be acknowledged or changed. Uh, Tracy. Hi, Tracy Gordon, Erdman Institute. Um, before Phil's excellent book, the seminal piece on the CBO was a Kennedy School case study about Alice's contributions in the beginning and the management challenge of an organization that has both policy analysis and cost estimates under the same roof. Um, having just finished a stint in government, um, one area where I was surprised to see how complex both sides of the equation were uh, was in transportation. So the scoring of the Highway Trust Fund and transfers from um, general revenues is very complicated and people uh, I think agree now that it does in fact score, but there was some feeling that it doesn't score and there have been blogs written about this. Um, so that's an area where the, the arcana of budgeting is getting increasingly complex. Um, at the same time, I think that the policy analysis is very complex. It's getting harder and harder to identify what, if any, contributions a given um, infrastructure boost is going to have on GDP. So uh, in a world of constrained resources, given this tension between sort of cost estimates and policy analysis, I wonder where the panelists would like to see CBO focus our efforts. Well, and first, for the many, many people who haven't read the book, 
Um, I, uh, I, I wanted to point out something that was a very early decision that Alice made, which sort of continues to this day, uh, which is to organizationally separate budget analysis from policy analysis in CBO. That is, there's two possible organizations. There's one that says there's the world of infrastructure and we're going to have all the policy analysis, all the budget analysis essentially in the same division. There's another that says there are going to be people over here do policy analysis, people over here do budget analysis. Alice's concern, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, was that if you put it all together in one organization, the short-term work, the budget work, will always force out the policy analysis work. So I think that, you know, if, if you want attention paid to policy analysis, I think that's fundamentally the right way to organize for it. What I think you can't do anything about is the fact, is the other fact that I was sort of pointing to, which is that the budget number score and the policy analyses don't. Uh, so that you can have one part of, of CBO talking about the infrastructure effects on the economy and another part saying how much does it cost in the budget. Uh, the difficulty is in getting people to pay attention to the broader economic effects and not focus only on what it costs in the budget. And I don't know, uh, I don't know beyond saying what I said earlier, which is that the Congress needs to recognize that the cost is about the cost, it's not about everything. I don't know if that's a uh, that's about the way CBO does its work or even the amount of emphasis it places as opposed to how people treat the information. Unless somebody else wants to add, let me, I think we'll close here. I want to thank everybody for coming and particularly the panelists and Phil and, and Doug.